everybody. Welcome to Who's Your Band. Uh, I am coming to you from the West Palm Beach Airport. Uh, I have been here for almost nine hours now. So if I come off a little delirious or loopy, you understand why. But uh, to get us through, to get us through, we have I have with me uh, my co-host as usual, Mr. Sean Morton. How are you, Sean? You know, Jeffrey, when we do this every week and you're a mere nine miles away from me, it still feels like it's not enough distance. Uh, West Palm Beach is still not enough distance. So the next time we do this, hopefully you'll have a gig somewhere in Scottsdale, Arizona. What a time difference. And I'll feel a lot better. On that note, let's introduce us. <laughs> because we, we, we have two great guests today. So I'm going to introduce both of them. Okay. Um, we have singer, songwriter, uh, Maddie, Madison, Madison Hatter. I hope I'm saying it right. Maddie, am I saying it right? Madison, Madison Hatter. Yep. Madison Hatter. Okay, we, we're gonna get to you in a second, Madison. Okay, because I checked you out. Um, and we have comic actor, the co-host of the Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling podcast. The very funny Mr. Mark Riccadonna. How are you, Mark? What's up, dude? How are you? You're look look in, at this guy. I love that look you're stuck in an airport. I feel like we're finally back to normal. Yeah, <laughs> this is spending a Sunday at an airport. Comedy's back. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's full effect. <laughs> it's brutal. Jeff, it's I hope br- you spend $9. Yeah. I hope you spend $9 for a small pole in spring because you're parched. Not only did I do that, I spent $15 for four pieces of, of chicken tenders that was overcooked, oversauced. It was disgusting. Oh. And I, I, it's, it's, it's just been a terrible experience. This but day is just getting so much better. It really is. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to make you happy in your well, your home and air conditioned or wherever the fuck you are, and you're eating good, and then I'm just miserable. But let's let's talk to Maddie. Maddie, uh, how are you? Where where are you coming from? Where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. I'm in New Jersey right now. As well. Yes. Oh, you are in New Jersey. Jersey. Because. <laughs> Because, because you're a performer that is by coastal, right? You're in New Jersey and L.A., right? Yes. So I grew up in New Jersey and I went to college out in L.A. I went to UCLA. Um, so I still have a lot of friends out there and um, kind of found like a really great music scene out there as well um, on the Sunset Strip, Whiskey, mm-hmm. Go-Go. So um, most of my live shows, if they're not like in the city or around New Jersey, they're out in L.A. Can I ask North Jersey or South Jersey? North Jersey. All right. That's I love what I want South to hear. Jersey too, though. All right. What part? Of, what, from, I, yeah, North Jersey. What part of Jersey are you from? Um, I grew up in Livingston, and I'm in West Caldwell now. Wow, this is this is amazing. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, I was born and raised in Hudson County my entire life up oh, until oh. two months ago, uh, and I moved down to Middlesex County, uh, right around the corner from Starland Ballroom. Oh, nice. Yes. Starline Ballroom's awesome. Yes, it is. When it opens back up. You can just walk there. I really could. That's awesome because parking there is always a little Oh, tricky. it's a $6 <laughs> Uber. I've already, I've already mapped it out. <laughs> Amazing. So, Maddie, how did you get your start in music? Was Did you get it when you were in L.A. or were you always into music in, when you were growing up in New Jersey? I was always into music. Um, it started with Gem and the Holograms on Saturday mornings, uh, watching Gem and the Holograms. The truly but, outrageous. You know, learning the dances and all the little songs. Each doll actually came with a cassette tape with the different songs. And then on the B side, it was like the instrumental version. So I would learn the songs and then like perform them in my living room for my stuffed animals. Um, and then I got really into theater and being so close to New York, I was able to do a lot of professional theater growing up before I went out to LA. Um, what and did you do? I did, um, a couple like Broadway shows, um, when I was like in elementary school and I was a child actor. So lots of oh, okay. commercials and voiceovers and like all that stuff growing up. Um, I was in a Broadway show for almost three years. Um, and then just kept going with it in high school and majored in musical theater in college. What show were you in? Showboat. Okay. So you're doing showboat. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you're doing showboat and you're a student in New Jersey at the same time. 
Yeah, public school. And I didn't think that was weird at all at the time. I would just I thought it just meant that I had to like leave Wednesday at lunchtime to make it into the city for the matinee. And I was like doing my homework in the car and backstage and practicing flute and violin for like band at school. Um, I made it work and it was a lot of fun. It was an amazing experience. When you went to LA and you went to UCLA, did you study musical theater or theater or I music did. at all? Yeah, I was a musical theater major. So um, that program was awesome because we learned all different aspects of the theater. We took like set design classes, lighting, uh, costume, and then acting, dancing, singing. And uh, yeah, I loved it. Going to college in LA is just like an epic experience. Greatest place on the planet. I've said this a million times. I love, love it. LA. I'm obsessed with LA. Yes, I am I too. I watch as often as I can. I watched one of your videos and the first thing that popped up was the rainbow, which is my favorite place on oh, the planet. Cool. That must have been the music video for Never Knew. Yes. Never, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah, that was like a quick, like we have some time, let's make a music video. And the Sunset Strip is right there and I'm obsessed with it. So yeah, I'm glad I got to capture that. And it was funny too, because like that weekend there was some sort of like bike rally. So all these bikers were like chilling at the rainbow and I'm like, la la la, walking by. I'm obsessed with the rainbow. Yeah, me too. It's the, I always say it is the greatest pizza in the world besides the, West, besides the East you. Coast. I say that to people in New Jersey and they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, I love the ra- the pizza at Rainbow. I'll go there like even just during the day and like journal and like write stuff and eat a pizza. It's the best. I'm so happy about that. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, this is a music show. Sean wants to talk about pizza. He he could do that on the Mount Rushmore pizza shows. Okay. Because yeah, that's another show. <laughs> 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 But let's talk about, I, I want to talk about you and your voice because you have a, such an interesting voice to me. Um, cause I, cause I, I checked out a few of your songs that like, um, lose my mind, uh, the cover the Aerosmith cover, nobody's fault, never knew, you know, and you sound different every time I hear you, like you have, you like nobody's fault to me was very, very folksy. It sounded, it had a sixties sound to it. And, you came across like a like, like a Joan Baez type, wow. you know, like a like like a singer sort storyteller. Then mm-hmm. you and now Sean, back me up on this because you checked out Never Knew as well. And yeah. didn't you think she had um, a very country sound, almost like a uh, a Miranda uh, Lambert type of sound? So you know, there was are you influenced by that? Um, I have a ton of influences. Aerosmith is my number one influence when it comes to rock music. And I love how they can kind of dance around different genres. They're, you know, true to rock and even a little pop with some songs. But I, like um, your, I even like your arrangement for Nobody's Fault. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have to give credit to my producer as well, Rob Bailey. He played guitar on that. And he also produced um, my latest yeah, well song, done. Wild and Strange. But I think, you know, I have a ton of different influences. And um, it's also been like a chunk of time. And I'm kind of learning as I go and growing as I go. So I think my sound has uh, changed along with that. Never Knew and Lose My Mind are both off of a full length album that I released uh, in early 2016. And that was very oh, wow. much inspired by. Um, you know, like the Sunset Strip, like rock music. Um, and there's definitely some country twangs in there too. I guess that's just like naturally where my voice falls. Um, and then Nobody's Fault, um, we kind of, that's one of my favorite Aerosmith songs. And we really went out of our way to make that more of a lullaby-esque song and have it be very natural and very, like you said, kind of like folksy in a way um, to really shine a spotlight on the lyrics of the song. Um, one of the reasons why I love that song to begin with is because it's so hard hitting and it doesn't sound like anything else in the world. Um, but the, you know, you don't really focus on what Steven Tyler's saying. It's more about the vibe of the song and the instruments. And it's like an attack on your ears in like the best way. Um, but having such like deep lyrics, um, I didn't want that to kind of slip away and I wanted to to make that the focus. So I guess that kind of brought that other side out. And that's where that 60s influence comes in because mm-hmm. a lot of those 60s singers were storytellers. New Wealth is a storyteller. New America's storyteller. 
Mark Rigadana. He is. If you, if <laughs> who's at, the worst king of look, Segway? Jeffrey Paul. <laughs> if you look, if you look at Mark Rigadana's bio, I want to, I wanted to find him and kill him because he's that, he's America's storyteller. I didn't write that. <laughs> Yes, you did. You, you, you're America's storyteller. It was something like that. But he's a great storyteller. I, I've worked with Mark before. He, he's funny as shit. He's handsome as a devil. And <laughs> Are you sure you didn't look it up? And you know how it says hey, wait, that wait, wait. on Wikipedia, wait, wait, wait. American I'm, I'm, stand-up comic. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. It wasn't Mark with Rick and Don. It was Bob DeBono. That's why I'm getting you mixed up. Oh, thank but, God. Uh, no. It's like, I don't think I've ever said I was American. So I'm no, going, it's kind of, it's kind of like this generation's Mark Twain, okay? Yeah, it's kind of like the flyer that, you know, that Jeff just had made for the show that we're doing in two weeks where I have my credit as last comic standing, where I was actually just in the intro of season four's episode one for four seconds. <laughs> and this fucking credit has been haunting me for the last 10 years. <laughs> Sean, I'm sorry. I, I thought maybe America's Got Talent or, or Less Comic Standing would hold a little more weight than the Bayonne VFW hall. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, you know what? If I worked the Bayonne VFW hall last night, I would have been home in 25 minutes. <laughs> Not sitting in an airport eating $46 chicken tenders. Yeah, for, for, for nine hours, correct. Exactly. <laughs> I win so, again, Jeffrey. Continue. Yeah, you, you, you do. Mark, Mark, Mark is an, Maddie, Mark's an interesting guy because he, he also, Mark, did you also grow up in New Jersey or was it like Pennsylvania, Ohio area? Youngstown, Ohio. That's actually where I, I am right, right now. I'm actually in really? my right. childhood bedroom. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and we're talking about music from the 90s. I'm like, hey, this is the place to do it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, know, you're a big, I know you're a big Alice in Chains fan. Is that the yes. band that you want to talk about today? No, I do love Alice in Chains, but uh, specifically, I was thinking um, the band that I think is so underrated is Cinderella. Oh, thank oh. you, Lord. I think they're Maddie, one of the you, most. Maddie, do you like Cinderella? Oh, I love Cinderella. Oh, I love them. Oh. Tom Kiefer is phenomenal. I, my yeah. biggest thing about Cinderella is that I always hated the fact that they got lumped in to this whole 80s metal Absolutely. hair band 100%. vibe. Absolutely. And they are nothing but a pure blues rock band that just came out at the wrong time. And had yeah. they come out either seven years earlier or seven years later, they would have been the, one of the biggest bands on the planet. Yeah, I think it's a lot because of like Bon Jovi was kind of their person who discovered them and launched them into stardom that they got lumped into this like hairspray tight spandex. But they weren't that they were no. they were like long haired leather blues singers. And I just I absolutely Tom Kiefer has my favorite voice, probably. Oh, sure. Uh, and it, 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 you can hear him sing live the same song three times in a row and you'd be completely OK because each time he puts so much into and you're a musical theater person. So you probably know this more than anybody putting all the emotion into what he's singing makes it maybe he doesn't hit the exact notes that would be like perfect sounding. But the pain and everything in his voice, you just feel it and you're like, I could hear this again. Like start the song over. Let's hear it again. <laughs> which 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 songs kind of stand out to you in in that? Because for me, when I I mean the first thing that really turned me on to Cinderella was Nobody's Fool. Oh, that's and such a good when, one. When you're so when you're talking about a guy who's singing and telling a story, Maddie, right? When you're telling a story, I mean, he did an amazing job on that. And yeah, they they shouldn't have been lumped in as a hair band, but you know, a, a lot of it. It was the look and everything. You know, we just had Bobby Brown on a couple of weeks ago and we said the same thing about Warren because Warren was more than yeah. cherry pie. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. My thing yeah. with Cinderella is that Night Songs is a, is a good album. Great, Long Cold Winter album. is a great album, but their masterpiece is Heartbreak Station. And that's kind of and when it came out, it was really at the very beginning of the whole changeover. Into the, the, the grunge, the the 90s. Yeah. into the grunge era, and that album, man, to this day, still stands the test of time. And Heartbreak Station alone, the, the song itself, is a beautiful, sad love song. 
Yeah. You know, uh, that's a great one. Shelter Me is another great one off that album. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, it, isn't Heartbreak Stations like basically a really produced country song for that time? Oh, I agree. It's yeah. more of a country song than it really is a 80s hair band. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, and there's a lot of guys like that from that era. They got lumped in the hair metal that I feel like shouldn't have. John Karabi, that guy. I mean, he should be he should be looked at the same way somebody like a Rod Stewart's looked at, where it's like it's just a voice. Plug him into any style of music, and his voice will plug in and make it a new thing all on its own. Absolutely, and you know, there was the one song, Madison, that I had heard um, when I was listening to your stuff earlier. Uh, the new sing, I guess it's the newer single, Wild and Strange, where. I actually thought of a 90s singer, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with her work. When I heard the song, it's kind of what it reminded me was Sass Jordan. I've heard the name for sure. A very not uh, super familiar. Yeah, you check her, check her out. She she had a string of uh, a string of hits in the 90s, and it, it really uh kind of struck me like that kind of vibe where it's kind of bluesy, a little raspy. But uh, that's the first person I thought of when I heard that. That was the first one that's I heard. So cool! I'll definitely check her out. Yeah, she's really, really good. And what, for the record, your... I love hair bands too. But Cinderella, I <laughs> yeah. feel like is in a whole Different. other dimension. I actually got to open for Tom Kiefer like oh. three times, and he's a pro. Like I could hear him like through the wall doing his vocal exercises, and it's like the same kind of vocal exercises that you would do for musical theater, like because. <laughs> Didn't he something he had happened voice to paralysis? His voice. Yeah, he lost he his had voice. To, like relearn how to sing. You would never know that now. It, I don't. It was a ninety-one his or voice ninety-two. Is amazing. He was at like the peak of like where metal was. Hair metal was about to go out, and grunge was coming in, and uh, he lost his voice. Right? It was a ninety-one, ninety-two. Era. Right, right after Heartbreak Station. Yeah, and. Basically, like where I grew up, um, Ty Longley, the guitar player from Great White, who passed away in Rhode Island from my hometown, he oh. three miles down the road is where he, my cousin and him learned guitar at the same time. They're pals. So this area was devastated when Tom Kiefer lost his voice. Like this, like where I grew up, people, that's all they talked about. You go to the bar, they weren't talking about some guy broke his leg playing football. They were like, Tom Kiefer might not be able to sing again. Can you believe that shit? Like (laughs) it was like big news here. And, um, and I think he actually sounds better now than he did then because now he's like, like Larissa was saying about being, now he's a pro, you know, he's doing it the right way. And, yes. uh, is, is he back in Cinderella? No, he's, no, no, he's just Tom Kiefer, Ben. And he's released some solo material, which is incredible. And yeah. very pleasing. Yeah, they did right. a great, he did a bunch of, he did a new album a couple of years ago and he did right. a, uh, a version of Nobody's Fool with Lizzie Hale from Hailstorm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Which was great. Off the charts. Off I the was charts. on Don Jameson's show when he was releasing Rise and he came on and I got to be part of the interview. Oh, nice. Right. And I'm friends with his bass player, Billy Mercer. And I was just sitting there like fanboying. Like I was, I was so nervous to talk. I didn't want to like ask any questions. So I kept writing stuff down and passing it to Don. <laughs> asking this, asking this. <laughs> and um but did I he was, know that you were America's storyteller? I well, that's the problem. I didn't want <laughs> him to get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I I was on the Monsters Rock Cruise as one of the comics and we got to mingle with all of the musicians and you hung out with them or drinking backstage or doing whatever, you know, and Tom Kiefer was even out of all of the famous musicians that were on the ship, he was still the mystery. He was still the, nobody really like knew what he did during the day. It'd be like you were in the club and they were doing the Alice Cooper jam night. And all of a sudden Tom Kiefer and Savannah would come into the room and everybody kind of like, like vampire royalty just walked in. <laughs> don't you kind of like that though? Like, don't you want to see 
a little bit of mystery when you when you're talking about a rock star. I loved it. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. I mean, I was hanging out with uh, Kelly Kagi and the guys from Night Ranger. Night Ranger. We were hanging out with them in Tesla, and it was kind of like after a while, it'd be like, "Hey, what's up, man? Hey," and it's like, I don't <laughs> want my rock stars to be on that that low. I want to still get nervous when yeah. I see them. Like we're high five and sitting in the. Uh, we're at the airport with Tesla and they put us in a VIP room and like, we're cracking. I'm telling street jokes to like a band I grew up worshiping. That's so cool though. But it kind of like made me like, but now I, now they're, they're not that big mystery that like, I always thought Tesla like come out of the desert, like a sandstorm showed up and all of a sudden (laughs) they show up. We're ready to sing. (laughs) I did. I had something weird like that. Like a, 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 probably like 10 years ago, I did these, I'm a big wrestling fan. So I did these things called ring roasts where we roasted these like really popular <laughs> older wrestlers. I don't think I would do that. The, the roid rage. I think they would kill you. Yeah. Right. Well, no, there was this one guy who like I, I admired so much as a kid, like as a kid, he was one of my favorite wrestlers. And like, he was one of those guys kind of like it? that. Uh, Kevin Von Erich. He was one of the Von Erich family. Of course. So the whole Von Erich family died except for him. And so like he was in one of those guys. So you decide to roast them. No, no, no. I, well, I, I couldn't roast them. I actually, on the on the dais, I said, everybody, you're all getting fucking mur- murdered, except for Kevin. I can't say anything bad about him. But we had um like a meet and greet before the show, like a VIP meet and greet. And he was one of those guys that kind of like went into the darkness for like 20 years. No one had heard from him. And for some reason, he became like uh, very comfortable with me and he was like hey listen i'm really uncomfortable doing these signings and talking to people you seem like a really nice guy do you mind if we grab dinner and i sit next to you during the during the signing and i'm like yeah it's fine it's totally fine (laughs) i I totally and like the whole time he wouldn't say anything to anybody he was whispering in my ear the whole time i completely fanboyed out completely (laughs) That's so it's like, weird because you you've met bigger people than Kevin Von Eric, but the, well, it's, it's funny, again, it's, it's like who it, we geek out over. No, I've geeked out a couple times. Believe me, I've geeked out. I think I told this on the on the on the show the one time we were doing a documentary. To, tell tell to Maddie though. Tell tell, <laughs> tell your embarrassing story. I've had a couple of really embarrassing <laughs> stories. Um, there, was, there was one where we were doing a documentary on, on a wrestler and Ric Flair was there. Now, Ric Flair is probably the greatest wrestler of all time. Now we're standing on the stage and they're just about to do the Star Spangled Banner. And Rick is literally an inch from my shoulder. And I looked over and I just went ah, like that. <laughs> And he puts his arm around me and he goes, he puts his arm around me. He goes, I know, man, that gets me every time too. And I go, I know. Right. So here I am with one of my heroes and we're crying during the star spangled banner for two totally different reasons. Oh my God. (laughs) And then the other time was when I met slash from guns N' roses. Cause if you see behind me, there's a guns N' roses flag in my office they're my ultimate band. I get to, I get the chance to meet him after a show. And uh, my friend says, go to this line. I go and he comes out and he's a little man. He's only like five, four and I'm six, three. So I'm towering over this guy and they go, he can't sign any, uh, he's, he's going to sign stuff for you. He can't take any pictures. Just going to shake your hand and keep going. So I'm scrounging to find something. I get my ticket. It's my turn to go up there. Now I have a slash tattoo on my arm. He's the reason hey. why I got into music. He's the reason why I became a comic. Like it's this whole big full circle thing. And I walk up to Slash. He looks up at me. He goes, what's up, dude? And I went, ah, like that. And I literally <laughs> could not talk. And he thought that I was probably like a Jerry's kid. Because like he looked <laughs> at me and he was so like borderline freaked out. I never saw a person sign something so quick and throw it at me. Oh, this <laughs> was literally Maddie. This away. was last this was last week. It was last Tuesday. Yeah, it was last Tuesday. <laughs> but yeah, I don't get starstruck, man. I My don't brother get star made struck that struck. same noise when he met Slash, but for a different reason. <laughs> we were at the Rolling Rock Town Festival in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and we were uh, Velvet Revolver was closing the show, and we we're in Disturbed's trailer getting loaded. 
I mean, completely loaded. And we're out on their balcony of their trailer and Slash comes walking up the thing. And my brother yells, Slash, because he just bought like a 54 Chevy. And my brother yells like, Slash, I heard you got a new 54 Chevy. My 68 Charger will kick its ass. And he was like, <laughs> oh, fuck you, man. And then my brother goes, why don't you come up to the the trailer have a couple Jägermeisters with us. And within three seconds, there was like eight bodyguards had my brother against the wall. <laughs> he has one drop of alcohol. This, this whole thing's oh. over. The whole oh, thing's man. over. My brother's going, oh! <laughs> I, I did one of those stupid things too out in uh, San Bernardino. I had met Vinnie Paul from Pantera. Oh. And it was probably about a year or two after his brother had gotten murdered. He was in hell. Yeah. At the point at the time. So I'm, I'm going up, I have my pass and he's wearing a Cowboys Jersey. Now I'm out in California and we were just bullshitting. I woke up, I go, Hey man, I got a real problem with you. And the same thing happened. It was like security guards came rushing because of what happened to his brother. And yeah. I was like, no, 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 I'm a Giants fan. That's all I meant. I'm a Giants fan. That's all I meant. That's all I meant. Don't shoot me. <laughs> you shouldn't have said that either. <laughs> no. I- <laughs> That's what happens when you try to inject a little personality. Yeah, sometimes you just got to get your autograph and fucking move on, you know? <laughs> exactly. Lesson learned. Lesson learned. So let's get back to, let's get back to Maddie. Maddie. It's what, what is he doing during the? It's Maddie Sin. It's Maddie Sin. <sighs> like Madison. But it's Maddie She's right Sin. here. Why don't we ask her? You're it's calling Madison. her Larissa. I mean, my real name is Larissa, <laughs> but my rock name is Madison. I just spell it a little strangely. Yeah. So, but what have you been doing during the lockout, though? You know, for, for comics, you know, we would we were able to do some Zoom shows. What, what were you able to do? I was able to take care of my son mainly, <laughs> and write music, and you know, just write. Um, but I'm a stay-at-home mom, so um, not a lot changed for me, except um, there was like a six-month chunk of time where my son wasn't in preschool. He's back at school now. Um, but we finished, um, a couple tracks that we had been working on pre pandemic, um, virtually. And one of those is wild and strange, which came out like two weeks ago. And then I have another song coming out at the end of May with the same guys for the most part. Um, so finishing up that writing, I have other projects that I've been working on outside of music. And also, um, I've always journaled. So, you know, just continuing to journal and come up with ideas for future material. You have Frank yeah. Ferrer on your on on Wild and Strange, who right. is one yes. of the one of my favorite drummers. And I love the awesome. story. I just love the story that when they put Guns N' Roses back together, you have Matt Sorum, who's in three of the greatest rock bands in, in, of the last thirty years, and the Cult and Guns N' Roses and the Cult and and Velvet Revolver. And Axel right. loved Frank so much that he insisted that Frank is the drummer for Guns N' Roses. Yeah, and, and he's, he's been on with your them song for like a decade. Yeah, it really he's the longest reigning drummer in the band, if you really think yep. about it. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's a good friend of mine and my family's. That's great. Yeah, he great was guy. a Jersey guy too. He just moved out to California like right before the pandemic, but he was living in New Jersey. Are the things opening up for you a little bit? <laughs> Sorry? Are things open it are things opening up for you a little bit now? Like any plans on touring? I don't have any dates scheduled right now. I'm kind of just going to let the dust settle a little, a little bit and see what's going on. I didn't have any dates that I had to cancel because of the pandemic anyway. Um, I haven't been doing as much live performances um, now that I've been a mom. Um, my only show since becoming a mom was at the Whiskey A Go Go. Uh, I guess it was like a year and a half ago now, opening for Lita Ford. Um, nice. any other show? Yeah. She's awesome. She's amazing. That yeah, was, how was that? Cool night. but, um, <laughs> any shows that I've been doing, um, outside of that, it's kind of been hopping up with other artists, um, and being like their guest for a couple songs and then, you know, hopping back down and enjoying the rest of the night. Very gotcha. cool. So I don't I have any plans. I mean, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I wish we could do that with comedy. Like Jeffrey Paul's doing a show. I'm just going to hop up to two bits with them. And then I'll just 
Go back in the crowd and drink and watch the show. Well, Jeff kind of does that. He just does that at every show. He just tells two jokes and he just strings the rest of it along. And then <laughs> and they, they bring guest comics up and do shots of uh, of Jameson. And before you know it, I'm uh, hanging out with Gino Pisconti in Altoona somewhere. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, I've been that, there. I've been yeah. there. What, what, what do you think? I just pulled that out of my ass. <laughs> That's oh my god! <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is your is your is your husband also in music? No, he's a music fan, oh. but he's not in music. Oh, okay. He appreciates music though. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you had your ideal band to back you up who would be your ideal backup band like you you have a huge record deal and there's musicians at your disposal who do you pick to be your guitar player on your right your bass player on your left and your drummer behind you i mean honestly this is gonna sound cheesy but the guys that i just recorded with oh you suck can you give me some real answers please i mean they all have so many credits behind them and so much experience and so much like that I've learned from them, but they're also friends of mine, like Frank, Rob Bailey, um, Brett Bass, Rob Flores, who's on the next one coming up. Like they all jammed together in the city under the name Mule Kick. And that's the band that I've hopped up with a bunch of times. And I've just learned so much from them. Um, like as humans, but also as, a musician. And, um, it was amazing that they worked with me on these songs and, um, we're going to be doing a couple more too. And they're just like great humans. And I think that that is the most important part of it. Um, do you have a, uh, do you have a full length in mind uh, coming out next year? Like a full I length record? I have a feeling what we're going to do is continue like dripping singles. Um, because that's just what makes sense right now. Um, in many regards, is that the way, the, is that the, way the music business right now that, it, is that well, if you want to get on like Spotify playlists and you want people to kind of focus their attention on one thing at a time, it's um. If you if you release singles, it's easier to do that. Um, and especially because I've been away for a couple years, I wanted to put all of my time and focus on Wild and Strange. And like the next one is Treasure, which is a very different vibe, um, but still kind of like goes with Wild and Strange. So I wanted to then focus all my energy on that one. So we'll probably keep like dripping the singles and then um once we get towards the end, maybe release an EP with some bonus material. And yeah, I, I see a lot of that. Had, like released as singles. I see a lot of that. And, and I think it's great because, you know, you can you can go into the studio, record a really killer song and just literally throw it right out there instead of waiting mm-hmm. a year and a half, two years to get, you know, 13, 14 more songs, putting mm-hmm. it all out. And then that single can kind of fall into the wayside too. So you keep putting out singles. You're always staying fresh in your fans mind too. I think That's it's a great, I, I think it's a great business model. I really do. Yeah. Did it's you, different than the last release. Cause I did the full length album in like 2016 and that was, I think like 10 songs. And then I kind of like shifted the focus. I would release a music video for one single off of that and then another one, but it was still the same album. So i feel like doing it this way it's like all in and then all in with something else i I think that that's going to be a cool experience and different than the other the music industry is different than it's now that it was say 10 15 years ago even five years ago Right. You know, but one thing uh, you didn't realize, though, uh, Madison, is Jeff's first job out of uh, school is he was an A&R rep that's for, awesome. uh, for, for Columbia Records. Yeah. That's yes, I, I worked for, I work, I, yes, I worked for CBS Records. In the CBS A&R Records, department. sorry. Yeah, yeah, I've never brought that up on the show before. No, he was also uh, in The Irishman. Did you ever see that yeah, movie? <laughs> That movie, The Irishman. Oh yeah. So it's uh, it's Sunday at seven thirty-five. So uh, we'll be done around eight o'clock, Madison. If you put it on Netflix now, sometime around Tuesday at two o'clock in the afternoon, it'll be done. It'll be wrapping up. Yeah. So you can definitely check him out on that too. Awesome. My my flight delay here. Yes, that's exactly. (laughs) Jeff will be back in New Jersey by the time the movie's over. Yes. So, yeah, but, but when were but you was, when were you working there? How different well, yeah. is it now? 
Well, now the thing is, everything was album driven. So, and this was in the uh, late to, late 80s, early 90s. Nice. So everything, so everything was album driven. Like you put out an album and you made money off the album and you toured to support that album. Mm-hmm. Now it's the exact opposite. Now you put out the album, but you're making money off the tour and the merch. Right. It wasn't the touring that really was your, your primary focus of uh, making money. Um, it's harder. It's much harder for, for a musician now because at that time you also didn't have um, the sharing and you didn't have the internet like, like right. there is now. So, so, you know, who's, it's hard to protect your property, your artistic property. Yeah. You know, um, radio isn't the driver it once was. Now, like you said, Spotify, streaming. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's like you. And also, also, I think people have changed. I don't think people. Ha- I mean, sure, Mark, you guys backed me up on this. But I don't know if people really have the endurance to hang in there for a full album. And I think they just like hearing like singles. Old, so old how do you make? How do you profit do. off that? Old school people no, but, do, which is why I still collect vinyl. You know, I got 800 records upstairs because I make the investment. Yeah, I have. Well, what do you think about this new generation of people? Well, you know, yeah, the, I mean, the, I think that too. Their, their attention span to the attention span of uh, the younger generation, I feel like is, you know, they want to put on Spotify and they like Queen. So they just want to hear 15 songs that sound like Queen. They don't want to hear the whole album of a, you know, Queen album. And I, I, I notice when I travel with younger comics, they're like, you still have CDs or you still have like long playlists on your drive that you put in and you listen to like the entire albums. Mm -hmm. And they think I'm nuts. Like you want to hear every song on that album. It's definitely, it's definitely a different, a generational thing because I would, as much as I love another one bites the dust by queen, I want to hear the game from beginning to end. Yeah. You know, I feel and like oftentimes the deep tracks outshine like whatever the, sure. the single is. Anyway, I feel that way at least about like ACDC or Aerosmith. I yeah. love the deep tracks. Well, that's my brother. Last night I was hanging out with my brother. I haven't seen him forever. And they were playing on a, I don't know which, what, what it was, Spotify or whatever. And he kept saying, he'd pick a band and then go, now hit deep tracks or hit like a B-side thing. Because I want to hear the band. I don't want to hear the hit. Yeah, like, I mean, and look at the single that you did for for uh, the Aerosmith cover, Nobody's Fault. Yeah. Now, Rocks is exactly. a great album. Rocks is. is one of their best albums. Mm-hmm. Back in the Saddle is one of their greatest songs. Mm-hmm. The easy thing to do is to cover Back in the Saddle, but you pick Nobody's Fault off that yeah. record, which I appreciate. Exactly. I really appreciate that because I don't want to exactly. hear... I don't want to hear anybody cover Stairway to Heaven ever again. I don't want to hear (laughs) anybody cover a hit. If I want to hear something, I want to hear a little more obscure song. And that way I can even go back and really listen to the original version a little more and appreciate it a little more too. Totally. I totally get that. And I wouldn't even consider nobody's fault. I mean, it is a deep track, but they definitely have deeper than that. I feel like. I get that. I get that. I feel like if you're going to be on the top top 20. No. Sorry, I said it wouldn't. Nobody's fault wouldn't be on Aaron Smith's top twenty. When True. if you if you just picked a you know a, a, a random fan or a casual fan, you mm-hmm. know they would know Dream On. They would know the stuff from the eighties uh, and the nineties. They would they wouldn't they wouldn't pick Nobody's Fault. And that's and that's what, and I think Sean is right. I think that's what's kind of impressive about it, and that you also didn't do a spot on version. You did your own take on it, and I I, I like hearing that as well. And that and that's what. Like if that was the first thing I heard, and that's what made me say, "Let me see what else this uh, girl has." And then oh. I checked out more, and everything I listened to sounded different, sounded really good. And I was like, "Okay, and she, you know, she's legit. She, you know, you're, you're, you, you can go. you can see there's like a you know there's there's talent there, but it was also there's like an appreciation of the history and the music For of, sure. of you know what of what you, of what you're playing. Like you're connecting." with and not not just singing like like sometimes you'll watch like a use like american idol or, or or the voice and you know they're they're great talented but they're not connecting with the songs that they're singing does that make sense i can't imagine being on a show like that just like the nerves would drive me <laughs> insane um but no i appreciate those shows for sure and they have to learn like a different thing each week um 
I feel like I would just be trying to remember the lyrics. Um, but <laughs> connecting is like really important to me, especially with the theater background and like acting background. I kind of approach a song or this last music video I did was really fun because I wanted to really get like deep into that character. Um, but like approaching it like as if I was singing it in the moment, kind of a, a theatrical approach to it, um, but have it still be rock music or, you know, acoustic whatever it is, you know, it needs to, it has to come from your heart as a performer. Yeah. And, you, and we, we go through that too, as comics too. I mean, we, we stumble across these people who are so regimented and will be doing the same set for 22 years. I wrote like, 45 minutes and that's what I do. Yeah. 45 <laughs> right. Speaking of Gino Visconti. Anyway, so <laughs> the, but that's the thing. Like you see these people who are just robots and yeah, they'll get laughs or the whatever. And it's just like musicians. You'll see musicians that are just going through the motions, but I've worked with Mark. I've worked with Jeff. We've all had great shows. We've all had bad shows, but you learn from the bad shows, you know, and yeah. I would rather take a chance and do something that I know may not work than yeah. constantly go back to the well of doing the same you know, Holocaust jokes like Gino does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a, a, a thing that I think uh, it kind of crosses paths here. Um, I've seen um, Paul Stanley do Phantom of the Opera. I've seen Sebastian Bach do Jekyll and Hyde. Do you think musical theater and rock singers, uh, the two different kinds, do you think there's uh, somehow you can get them to combine? Because I feel like a lot great of... Great question. The people who are really great rock singers aren't necessarily good at musical theater. Yeah, because they I think have to keep that voice up. That's true. They I don't mean, get to go. Now your turn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it depends on the person, and it depends on the material. Um, like my first, like gut response is yes. Like I, I definitely think that they can go hand in hand, and I've seen it done before, and I'm sure we'll see it again in the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially doing eight shows a week. I mean, touring's tough on the voice too, but doing eight mm. shows a week, um, yeah, it just depends on the material and the person, I think. I think yeah. it also is a great crossover too, because, you know, you have like metalhead people who are like, you know, they only want to listen to heavy metal or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they see maybe like Bruce Dickinson joining the cast of Miss Saigon or something stupid yeah. like that. <laughs> And they might say, oh, okay, well. Who would he play a Miss Saigon? He would play the siren, the warning yeah. siren. <laughs> uh, it's the first play that came into my mind. But uh, then, I think it's a great crossover. I think it's a great crossover, you know, because it, it opens up different forms of art to different people mm -hmm. that you wouldn't normally see. Did you guys see Rock of Ages when it Loved was it. on Broadway? Loved it. Loved yes. it? Yeah. I did I hate, too. I, I hated I, it. Really? <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> I wait. Not only did I hate it, the movie version of it is the worst like thing the I've ever. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. I I can't begin to tell you how bad that movie was and how uh -huh. embarrassing it was. Hmm. I like <laughs> I the premise. I, I just like the premise of it. Hearing like yeah. the songs that we grew really? up in you on really, a stage. You like the premise of it? No, you, not, you not, like not the movie. The movie was horrible. I'm, I'm talking about the actual play on Broadway. Yeah, I saw that. I actually, I'm embarrassed to say, I saw that four times on Broadway. And before I went to Rock of Ages, I actually was unfamiliar with a lot of the music that was in the show. And it was the show that made me be like, whoa, like, what's this genre of rock music that I'm unfamiliar with? And just like started listening to all sorts of like hair music and I love it now, but it was actually because of rock of ages that I so, started listening to. I feel like I, that probably would happen a lot. I seen rock of ages. I had no idea that Constantine was yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the guy from which American, American, Idol. American, Idol. American yeah. Idol. One of the, one of the talent show shows, you know, it's just a high school talent show. And when the movie that, that was just out dark state when I was producing on it, Constantine was one of the leads in it. Oh, and cool. they kept bragging to me. That's the guy from American Idol. It's the guy from American Idol. I'm like, I won't fucking know. Yeah, can't, you can't afford, on, 
Okay. <laughs> he came in fourth. He came, he, came, he, he came in fourth. He walks on set and I go, hey, you were in Rock of Ages. And they're like, that's Constantine, the guy from the Rock of Ages. I'm like, I don't know if he won the Tony or he was nominated, but I know there was. Tony. I think he was no, nominated. He, yeah, I don't think he won. He, he was. He was. He not. He was. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, he didn't originate the role, so I don't even know if he would have been nominated. Oh, I thought he, he did. He, he no. He took no. He no. He took over the role for, for yeah. somebody. Yeah, but he but he didn't originate it. Hey, Manny, remember in the movie version? There was a scene where Alec Baldwin and Russell Brand were singing into a, a comb or, or a brush, and they were singing, I can't fight this feeling anymore. I vaguely remember that. Yeah, I saw the movie yeah. once. <laughs> see, see, that, that's the image that, that is emblazoned in my brain, that, why I can't sleep at night. Oh, okay? no. <laughs> oh, my God. There, there, was, there was a scene in the movie where... <laughs> where, where um, Will Forte was an announcer. He was a, a reporter. And on one side of the street, everybody was singing, we're not going to take it. And then on the other side of the street, street, they were singing, we built this city. And it was like Kevin Cronin from um, REO and Sebastian Bach was in it, and Debbie Gibson. And it was just so embarrassing. Like, why would they even reduce themselves to, to having cameos in this just unbelievable piece of crap? Why am I admitting it freely in public in front of 20,000 people that are going to see this in the next few days that I was blasting friggin' uh, Jefferson Airplane, a, a Jefferson Starship, that nothing's going to stop us now hey, the other day? Holy were, shit. were you on a scooter with a mannequin holding on? Very close, very close. I was in a RAV, I was in a lesbian soccer mom RAV4 blasting it. Mark, I am, you know I am a sucker was? for cheesy songs. Like the, the cheesier, are, the better. You are. Do you know who the mannequin was, Mark? Kim Cattrall. No. Kim Cattrall. That's right. What's it? Samantha. From Samantha, Sex the, the whore from Sex and the City. Yeah. The whore from Sex and the City was the mannequin. She was yeah, the I'm youngest a, was that, person to graduate from the acting school I went to. Really? And mannequin was. I like that movie as a vehicle. kid, though. As it's a, it's a fun premise, you know. As a fun. kid, but oh, Jeff, you got Jeff. You're 30 years older than me, so of course you're gonna hate Not that. 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I was an 11 year old kid. You know, I loved that movie growing up. It was cheesy. You I guys still, should. I still find you myself you listening to the stupidest shit. Um, I, I was. Bl- that right. was a movie that came out right as like color came on movies. She's too <laughs> yeah. young to have seen it, guys. <laughs> If, if I knew Sean as an eleven-year-old kid, kid, it would have pinched his fat legs. Oh, oh dude, that was just, horrible. Just for, just for enjoying mannequin. <laughs> no, I also enjoyed New Kids on the Block very much as well, too. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I freely there admit are some that. things you probably shouldn't admit, but <laughs> not, I have no shame in my game, game buddy. I have no shame in my own game. It. I sure, did you see them? Did you see what? them in concert? No, I never saw them in concert, you but I wanted would, to go. I wanted to go a couple of years ago. I wanted to go a couple of years ago, but it's like not one of those things that you put on Facebook and go, uh, hey, guys, I got an extra ticket for Metallica. Who wants in? <laughs> You're going to get 55 responses in a minute. You're not going to say to all your comic friends, hey, guys, I really want to see New Kids on the Block because Boys to Men and Paula Abdul are opening up for them, too. Who wants to go? See, now here's where the, the weird thing is. I would admit that or do that now. But when I was in high school, New Kids on the Block were an actual thing. I would have been like, no, man, they're, they're, I don't listen to that shit. Yeah. I would have been so insecure. I freely admit that I love I love that shit. I would, I would love going to those 80s. I want to go to that 80s cruise. That 80s cruise that has like 75 acts and they only play Hold 75 on. songs because they all have one hit. <laughs> it's Mario Cantone. That's who would go to on that thing. I, listen, I know Mario very well. I used to go on Steam Pipe Alley all the time when I was a child. I see, I went on the Monsters of Rock cruise, and it was pretty much the same thing you said. None of the bands had hits, but they all had albums that sold like crazy. Who, who are you on there with, Mark? It was like Y and T, Karokas, um, Faster Pussy. That's women the Night. But I mean, they were never like top, you know, top ten hits. But their albums sold like crazy. 
Um, Focus was a big band that they did ballroom blitz. They were they, they were pretty big in the, in the and 80s. That, on that cruise, it was their first time all back together. They the uh well that, that's wow. why I asked about that's Walmart, why I asked about Walmart covered Cinderella. all those shifts, huh, Mark? <laughs> Dude, I woke up at like seven in the morning, ran to the top deck. Um, there was a, a Van Halen cover band that was just insane that played every morning. And then every single minute of the day until about 2 a.m., there was a huge band playing somewhere. You know, you run downstairs and it's, you know, uh, Night Ranger. Then you run upstairs and there's a, a winger. And then you run across the ship and there's, uh, I, there were so many bands. I can't even think. It sounds really good. What are you talking I about? Would love, I would love to do one of those cruises. It was, it was like the greatest five days ever. You know, and I think it was actually, it's funny you brought her up. Uh, Lita Ford was supposed to be on the ship, but she fucked up her passport. Oh no. So she had to fly and Poison did too. And Poison had oh, to fly boy. down. So they did the launch party. So the night before the ship left, Poison did the huge. She's huge a great band. Thing. And then Lita Ford had to meet when it came back to it was one of the islands that were still America where they didn't need a passport. And right. she was allowed on the ship to do the show. Then she had to be escorted off the ship and fly back. Oh, that's and a shame. It, it was awesome though, because it was like all these people had excursion plans that they were gonna go do shit, and then they're like, Lita Ford's coming, fuck that. I can go four-wheeling <laughs> anytime. <laughs> That's cool. But everybody on the ship was in black leather, rocking. I'm wearing like plaid shorts and a baby blue shirt. Those Everybody's cruises a, look like they probably look so like Mitch Foley. Fun. Yeah, they really was, do look a lot of fun. But I, I would think like after like four days, it's kind of like overload after a while. It's like Vegas. Yeah, you Kinda. start to like you start forgetting what day it is. Mm -hmm. You start forgetting like what's going on. Luckily, I Craig's sober, Craig Gas. Mm -hmm. So he was like kind of in charge of our schedule. Like, we're gonna go watch this band, then we're gonna watch this band, we'll watch this. I'm like, I'm just gonna follow you. <laughs> I, That's great. <laughs> the no, um, I, oh, you good. Sorry. I was, I I brought up um uh <laughs> Cinderella before because since the pandemic you start to see a lot of bands getting back together like you're seeing Sebastian going back with Skid Row and and there's so much money now to be made with touring I mean people want to be out there these bands have been doing nothing for over a year so that's why I thought there'd be if there was ever a time where a singer or or some, some strange member of a band would get back now would be that time I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, people want to get back with Cinderella yeah. Stranger he's things got, have happened. He's yeah. got such a good band right now. He does. Yeah, I don't I kind think, of feel. I don't yeah, think but he needs you put, it. You, but you put Tom Kiefer's name on a marquee as opposed to Cinderella, and you're going to sell more as Cinderella than you. I don't know that. I think. I think that. I. Yeah, I, I like, is anybody that. gonna like get ex any Britney Fox fans gonna get real excited? Jeff Lafar's playing guitar <laughs> with Tom Kiefer again. <laughs> I don't think I, think I don't so. think anyone. I think Cinderella is much bigger than Britney Fox. <laughs> exactly. I feel like <laughs> anybody who likes Cinderella knows who Tom Kiefer is. I think that that whole generation is a huge conglomerate of egomaniacs because when you see like L.A. Guns is going out to do a show, and then you go to see Tracy Guns's L.A. Guns doing a show. Like when they have these same bands oh, yeah. that split great off white. into two different bands, like Great White and then Jack uh, Jack Russell's Great White, uh -huh. knock it off. You no. know what I mean? No. Take the take I the twenty five people from the one show. Take the twenty five people from the other <laughs> show. Mix but if them you've together. written this material and you love it, and it's like your life's passion, and you want to perform it, but you don't get along with the other people in the band, I mean. That shouldn't stop you from performing. No, it shouldn't. Music. But go by like your that's name. What a lot of the stories are. Yeah, but go by your name, which is why I respect Tom Kiefer because he may have a problem with the guys from Cinderella, and he's just going out and saying, "Look, I wrote these fucking songs. I'm gonna play them. I'm not saying it's Tom Kiefer Cinderella." Right. 
You know, yeah, I, was, his, I have more respect his, for that. His sets were awesome because he was doing his solo material and then he was also doing Cinderella stuff. So yeah. you were getting like the best of both worlds, which was really cool. To yeah, Sebastian Bach did that for years too. Yeah. And, now he's, and now he's back with uh, Skid Row. No, I, have not, I, I think that's false, what Jeffrey. What drummer are they going to use? Rob Afuso. Are they going to go back to... All the yeah, way back. I think so. I, I don't know if that's confirmed, Jeff, because if it is confirmed, I'm going to go outside and weep openly in my yard because I'm going, I think, I'm going I think, I'm I think, go to I think that tour is going to happen this summer. And you also saw is Stephen is back with Rat. Stephen Burgess is back with Rat? Yes. Holy shit. I'd go see that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would go. I, I, I loved Rat. I thought that, uh, again, you talk about underrated bands and bands yeah. that got kind of like, kind of got like miscast. You know, yeah. like you, like, like, you know, they're more than just round and round. When you hear a song like Way Cool Jr., I mean, that, you know, they, <laughs> they, they, they were bluesy. They can play, you know. And supposedly he's gotten his act together because I remember right before the pandemic, there were some videos going around of Steven where he just was a total mess on stage. He played the um, out in Long Island somewhere and he, ju- he just couldn't sing. It was collapsing on stage, but he got his shit together. He's back with, uh, you know, I think he met with Warren, Warren DiMartini, you know, the uh, guitar player. Mm-hmm. And now, now things kind of like patched up and they're going, they're going back out on the road. So I surprised if a lot of these things like you said hey never again will happen now since the pandemic i think so madison why don't you give our uh fans your social media handles so they can check you out sure um right, everything is too. basically at madison hatter m-a-d-y-s-i-n hatter um and i'm on instagram facebook twitter um you can subscribe to my youtube and uh my music is on all digital and streaming platforms as well Yes, and download them so she can get a few cents from each song too. <laughs> Thank don't, you. D- don't illegally download like I used to do. I stopped doing. I stopped doing it years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Napster. You go on Napster. Show? I used to go on Napster, all the sites. But you know what? I had one of those realizations, like when we, you know, I think it's when you become an artist yourself and you start putting content out, and then you realize right. all the hard work that goes into it. Yeah. You know, and like a lot of times what I do now is I'll just buy the vinyl because the vinyl comes with a digital download. That's cool. You know, so at least I support, but yeah, support the people actually buy their music. It's very, very important. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, it's definitely important. And I have like Spotify and all streaming stuff, but I always buy the song on iTunes if I'm going to listen to it on any other. I do the same. I do the same. And I love uh, vinyl too, and CDs. <laughs> and yeah, stuff. CDs, are, CDs back. are a little so much. much. That's yeah. the funny thing is, how many times do I got to pay Gene Simmons to hear Kiss? Because yeah. I bought it when it was on cassette. I have the vinyl. Then I had to go buy it when it came out on CD. Now I have to buy the download, all for the same song. Yes, I'm, 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 I have a conundrum right now. Now, I, I have a conundrum right now because Record Store Day is coming in June, and they just announced that Motley Crue is putting out their discography on cassette Ooh. as a one as a one whole set. And now I'm saying to myself, That's I have awesome. every CD, I have every digital song, I have every vinyl. You have now to I'm get gonna, the set though. Now I'm going to be forced to buy a fucking yeah. cassette player just so I can buy this. For sure. Well, you don't even have to get the cassette player. I'm sure there's going to be like cool, like album art and stuff. It, it could just be like a, a set display. display. Could be. It could be a display Frame set. Name it like gold records on the wall. Like you just put yeah. Your I would do that. <laughs> well, These Jeffrey, are my sweet ass cassettes. Jeffrey, yeah. I, I'm being dead serious when I say I hope you get home safe. I hope your flight comes early because we do have a gig together in two weeks. I don't want to cover your five minutes. So if you can please just get home safe in one piece, I would greatly appreciate that. That's me being nice, Jeff. Thank you. You know, tickets are signed to sell for this show. Good. Good. Maybe it'll cover that $17 toll I'm going to pay to get to that fucking gig. Where are you guys playing? We're in Staten Island uh, at some place. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We're from Jeff's from Staten Island and I'm from New Jersey. So we're kind of meeting in the middle. <laughs> nice. which, which is five minutes from my house. That's meeting in the middle. Yeah, great. No cover <laughs> charge either. Next, you have to do Starland. Yes, we would love to do Starland. They're not opening until October, though. Oh, really? Not, wh- why? 
Uh, I talked to our friend who's the stage manager there, and uh, they're not probably going to be booking full shows there until October. They're not going to do any outdoor shows? It's not big enough to do an outdoor. They've done them, but it's not big enough to really do that. So, I mean, I know some of the shows that we had, I mean, Rage Against the Machine was my big show that I wanted to go to. They just postponed that to 2022. I saw that. Uh, some of the outdoor shows that we have are still scheduled to be open, but who knows what's going to happen. So, right. uh, Guns N' Roses is still on the books for MetLife. Yeah. I don't know how they're pulling that off, but we'll see. But Mark, what's your social media handles? So all of our fans can. At Mark Rigadonna on everything. I'm the only one out there. M-A-R-K-R-S. You know why Mark? Cause you are an original. I, well, I'm America's storyteller. So, that was a nice softball yeah. for that one. You hit that out of the park. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime America's storyteller comes on, you guys have been. No, no, because, because Mark Riccadonna is a pro. <laughs> hey, Mark, before you go, was there, are you still doing any acting You know, do, you know, know, during this? Have you done any auditioning, anything like that? So um, we, we produced a movie that was released in like 16 cities. And I, I don't know how they did that during the pandemic. I'm not going to ask questions, but I will take checks. So, um, <laughs> Amazing. so that came out. Um, I haven't really been acting. I, um, there was a couple of things I auditioned for, but then I started realizing, I don't think I want to go on a set and sit for a while. Yeah. I, I feel like, uh, a lot of restrictions still. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times the people that are in charge of running sets, like I don't trust them when there isn't a pandemic going on. Right. Um, like, it's a very, very valid point. It was one of my problems with comedy clubs when they were saying, no, we're open, but we have our restriction. We're fully COVID. And then like you see pictures and you're like, everyone in that audience looks like they have Corona. <laughs> Mark, the, re- the reason why I backed off on doing gigs because I was at the Comedy Zone in Harrisburg and this is before anybody can get, you know, vaccinated and all that stuff. And I'm sure you've worked there before. You in the hotel le- leads out to a courtyard. I was outside having a cigarette. I turned around and a heroin addict got this close to me and was asking me if he could score off of me. And I just felt every droplet from his mouth just oh flying God. onto my face. Yeah. It boiled my face in the friggin' hotel room. And how, how excited was that guy though when he heard they're giving free injections? And then how sad was it when he found out it was Johnson and Johnson? You fucking hack. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, people, Jeffrey, take it out. Guys, Maddie, thank you so much. Mark Riccadonna, thank you so much, Sean. I will see you hopefully in the next week or so. And yes. guys, please subscribe and follow us. Follow all our, our guests. And every now and then we throw up a guest on. So give us a like on those as well. And we'll catch you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>